Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Alliance for Water Efficiency webinar today. We're very happy to um, um, welcome you to a webinar where we're going to talk about affordable commercial, industrial, and institutional water and energy savings initiatives. We're very pleased to feature two of our AWE members who are going to talk to you about this important topic. It's part of our webinar series called Innovations in Efficiency where we feature business members of the Alliance for Water Efficiency who work in the water and energy efficiency space. So we're very pleased uh, today to welcome them. But before we talk to you about who they are, uh, I'd like to just give you a little bit of housekeeping information. Um, the webinar that we're holding today will be 60 minutes in length. Uh, we are going to have time for questions. So as you hear our speakers speak, uh, please go ahead and type in to your, your questions into the dialog box. Uh, and the way you access the dialog box is if you look in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a black bar with an orange rectangle and a white arrow. If you open that white arrow, uh, it'll open up a dialog box where you can type in uh, your questions. So we're, we're hoping you will be doing that. Um, we will be muting all of the uh, presenters, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we'll need you to type in your questions. And the reason we're doing that is uh, because we're recording this webinar, and we want to make sure we have as clean a recording as possible. Um, hopefully you are hearing my voice. The audio is through either your telephone or your computer microphone and speakers. Either one will work. Um, and again, your, your audio will be muted as far as we're concerned because we're we're going to be uh, recording the session. Um, and so the last thing I just want to suggest to all of you is that you, you think about questions that you'd like to type in as the speakers go along. We'll answer the questions in the order that they were received. Um, Liam and our staff will be reading out the questions, so feel free to type them in uh, along the way. So at this point, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speakers. Um, you already have heard from me. My name is Marianne Dickinson. I'm the, at least for this next month, at least, uh, the president and CEO of the Alliance for Water Efficiency. And today we have with us uh, Michelle Medaus and Anaki Chamberlain from the Medaus Water Management Group. And we also have Kip Barrett from Metris Energy. And both companies are going to be uh, presenting uh, to you today. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Michelle, who will uh, begin her presentation from Medaus Water Management. Well, thank you very much, Marianne. As we know, uh, businesses rely on water to perform daily operations and provide water qual you know, quality services to their customers. Um, However, uh, as they go about doing their practices, some equipment and water can leak or malfunction. And so what we're here to talk about today is uh, efficient um, and affordable ways for businesses to save water. So during COVID, uh, a lot of things have changed um, and businesses may or may not have the capital to do what we would call a standard water audit. Access to facilities is a little challenging right now and they may not have the funds to do what we standard uh, would recommend, which is uh, look for uh, water sense equipment to replace, look for Energy Star, type uh, appliances. Uh, and if that doesn't um, fit for a business at this point, what we're going to talk about today is what you can do. You can use existing staff. You can um, look for leaks. If you reduce a leak, then you can reduce your bills, right? And so as people are trying to operate more efficiently, that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, because during COVID, uh, we have seen a lot less um, on-site water audits, but that doesn't mean we can't do virtual audits. So we're going to talk a little bit about doing virtual audits and how to help your customers even if you can't gain direct access to their facility. Next slide. So I am um, Michelle Madaus um, from Madaus Water Management. Uh, we do work a lot with um, water providers on doing uh, water audits or water assessments or water surveys. They're all the same thing. You go into the facility, you take a look at what's on inside and give recommendations. Um, I've personally been doing water audits and trained water audits for about 20 years. Um, but Anaki is going to walk through um, recommendations um, 
or leaks and things that we share with businesses and to water utilities, um, but also slightly tailored to what we've been doing um, during COVID. And then at the end, we're gonna give some tips and tricks and some little um, sheets that you can use for leaks and tell you a few stories on how that these actually get applied um, in the real world. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Aniki. Great, thanks, Michelle. Yeah, so as Michelle said, the reality is, is you know, kind of despite the ebbs and flow of, of COVID uh, openings and closings, water is still flowing to CII properties. I mean, uh, properties, whether they're open or whether they're closed, there's still this base level of water that is going, that's needed to maintain the property, particularly for cooling and irrigation. And similarly, whether a property is open or closed, there's still people on that property pro either providing the services or ma maintaining the upkeep until it's able to open again. So even though uh, we, water efficiency professionals can't be on site as easily as before, it's actually a unique situation to provide the opportunity to help frontline on the ground workers incorporate water management into their daily routine. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So businesses can basically take control of their water use in the most cost-effective manager manage by, uh, manner by leveraging their existing routines. Uh, facility managers and staff walk through facility many, many times in a day to ensure things are running smoothly. So here's an example of a grocery store, very common example. You know, a shift manager is probably walking through there 20 times a day to make sure everything is clean, uh, operational, normal. There's not broken uh, inventory on aisle five, uh, you know, fro uh, 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 thawing meat, meat freezer on uh, aisle 10. So we're constantly walking around facilities anyway. Go ahead and uh, go to the next. So uh, we can simply incorporate leak detection into these daily existing inspection routines and then very quickly identify water waste issues and resolve them by the staff on site. Um, so equipment upgrades can definitely be effective and they're usually an outcome of an audit, but leaks are huge water wasters. So for example, a toilet upgrade might save you one gallon per flush, which is great, but a one gallon per minute leak in a toilet is gonna waste you know, 14, uh, uh, 1,440 gallons per day or over 43,000 gallons a month. A broken irrigation valve uh, or some a broken valve on kitchen equipment can easily go undetected and waste thousands of gallons. So by simply looking every day, we can uh, save ourselves a lot of water. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So if we can identify where water equipment is located as we're def uh, following these existing routines and simply look and listen for basically anomalies as we pass by, we can identify problems really quickly. Now, obviously most water equipment is designed to flow at least at some point intermittently, but almost no equipment is designed to run constantly. If it is, we can talk about that a little bit later. But so even though water might be flowing the first time we pass by on our first kind of floor walk, we can take note of that. But if it's flowing the second time and the third time and the fourth time we walk by, then we recognize there may be a mechanical failure and we can investigate further. So the idea is to just put that piece of equipment on the radar so if somebody walks by, they can take a look and see if uh, we're having constant flows. Now, if water is flowing on the floor, it's typically really obvious that there's a problem, but if it's flowing into drains, then we assume equipment is running as it's designed. Drains are basically the frenemy of, of water efficiency. So, um, you know, if equipment, if a valve fails inside of a water using equipment, it's gonna flow into the drain. So if we can know every time we walk by, take a look, oh, if water's flowing the first time, not a big deal. If it's flowing the second, third, fourth, fifth time into the drain, well, then we know we might have a failure inside of whatever the equipment is. And then also it's always an opportunity to look for operational use, which is basically how we use water. So leaving faucets running, uh, uh, things like that. So some equipment we're not gonna be able to able to see as easily as we uh, would like to. It might be in a closet or uh, under the drain might be in a closet or under a shelf or something like that. So we're also gonna have to listen a bit. So again, as we look through, once we locate where the drain is, if we can just take a second to listen, um, see if there's, we can hear constant flow. I was working in a facility where the cooling tower was on the roof and it, but it drained inside the building and it was uh, basically had a valve malfunction. It was flowing 30,000 gallons a day so you could absolutely hear it, but nobody knew what the drain was. So if we, that's an example where if we would have said, oh, if you hear water running every single time you walk by this drain, we've got a problem. This is also very easy in restrooms. Just poke your head in the restroom door and you can almost immediately hear a toilet, a running toilet. 
And then we oftentimes have staff and guests, uh, you know, we ask them to report to us if they see something that is displeasing um, as far as service. So we can just expand that and have them also uh, bring any constant water use to our attention. So uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So let's look at a couple of examples. So commercial restrooms, kind of the most basic and easily applicable. Uh, you can, you know, as you're walking around the floor, a lot of times we're poking our head in the restrooms anyways, just to make sure it's, it's clean for our, our guests. So we poke our head in the door, quickly look at the faucets, the urinals, and then listen for a toilet. In less than 30 seconds, we can uh, be sure, you know, be fairly confident there's not an issue and move on on our floor walk. Keeping in mind that commercial toilets um, can, can leak uh, over 35 gallons a minute. So it's just, they can really waste a lot of water in a short amount of time. So just doing that a couple of times a day really can catch those leaks quickly. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Commercial kitchens, obvious place where there's gonna be a lot of water use. Some of it's gonna be very straightforward, a lot of faucets. Um, and there's likely a ton of people in the kitchen all the time, especially if you're in a restaurant or something. So just putting water uh, constant flows on their radar will likely just uh, very passively help people identify and um, correct constant flows. This is also the place where you're gonna see the majority of the operational water use, people you know, leaving faucets on to, to thaw food or just leaving them on and walking away. So a lot of opportunity in the kitchen. Go ahead and go to the next slide. But as you go, almost all facilities are going to have some kind of complex equipment. Here we see a large cooling tower, common in many facilities, maybe not this large, but cooling towers, grocery stores and whatnot. Uh, we have a vacuum pump, things that are common in hospitals, grocery stores. So this equipment is complex, but not to worry because we can still detect failures as part of our daily routine because uh, most of these equipment or all, everything's going to have a drain. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So even though these, these equipment, is, this uh, pieces of equipment are scary, we don't have to be technical experts. We just have to know that if we're seeing constant flow, there could be a problem. And if we're seeing it for long periods of time, it's something to be invested. We can pass that over to um, we can pass that over to the, 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 tech, the technical experts or the technician or, or give a call to a, a CII support from your water provider or whatnot. So let's look, um, oh, and if you do invest, you do see constant flow, you investigate further and you see that the equipment may be a single pass cooling or something and that it's designed to use, uh, to run constantly, well, then it's time to upgrade to an Energy Star or water sense piece of equipment. And that's a different presentation. So let's take a look at a couple of examples, real world examples. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So here's a good example. This was from an elementary school. So we have two kind of complex pieces of equipment uh, here on the left. We have a water softener um, and a uh, hot water heater. Now, if, I, if I'm just you know normal staff, I don't have to really know anything about these, but I do can just walk by and you see that both of these pieces of equipment flow into a drain. I can walk by as I'm doing my normal uh, facility walk, take a look, say, oh, is there water constantly flowing? I'll probably be able to hear it. If it is the first time, no big deal. But if I go by three, four or five times and it is, well, then I know I might have a problem. Uh, next slide. So, I'm not saying this is gonna be easy everywhere. <laughs> so here is a cooling tower uh, where um, you can see in the picture on the left, the kind of uh, the, the pipe that comes out as an L shape and goes into the building. This is actually the drain for both the uh, overflow and the blowdown, regardless. So I had to go through two garages um, to find the drain. And as you can see the picture on the right, the drain is even plumbed directly into the concrete. So sometimes it's going to be very difficult. That route may not be on your normal uh, walk. So you may be expanded or you may be, you know, say, well, we're not going to be able to capture that one. Or maybe it's a good opportunity to just listen, poke your head in there and see if you can hear water flowing. Uh, go ahead and go to the next one. And then in some situations, it uh, may require some uh, bending and stretching. Here's a combi from a commercial kitchen with the drain uh, underneath. In fact, behind the machine is also a um, water filtration system. So uh, all, both of them have valves, they could fail. And so this one, you would either have to, you know, kind of get down your hands and knees to take a look under the machine or just know, you know, that maybe you stop and take a listen. 
But again, there's going to be staff in the kitchen um, all day, every day. So if you can uh, just kind of alert staff in a staff meeting, you know, uh, these are the places that use water in the facility, in the um, whatever the department area is. If you see something constantly flowing, alert somebody. Okay, go ahead and go to the next slide. So to recap, facilities have existing daily operational routines, and by incorporating water management into these routines, facilities can save many, many dollars in water costs and damage with almost no additional effort. It's just putting the water using equipment on the radar. So facilities can begin to incorporate leak detection by basically locating and mapping the water using equipment in the facility. So this could be a physical map or it could just be a mental map for the shift manager, but you just wanna take some time to investigate, look in closet, look under shelves, and basically identify all the uh, water using uh, drains and uh, water using equipment and drains in the facility and just put those on your uh, route through the facility. Um, and again, this may this this routine may be isolated to the shift manager and that's the person who needs to know, or it may be something that uh, can be expanded to appropriate staff, depending, you know, you might be in a large institution where you have, you know, multiple kitchens, whatever it is, uh, but you want to train the appropriate staff and just um, alert people that if they see anything constantly flowing, even if it is a complex piece, piece of equipment, to, uh, to alert their manager and report constant flows. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So lastly, uh, depending on your facility, uh, it, it, it likely is beneficial to expand your daily routine. You know, it's very common for facility uh, managers or shift managers to make a path through the, through the store and, and identify problems or potential problems, but um, we don't always make it outside. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So basically the first part of the presentation, we focused on inside water use, but outside water use, basically the irrigation and cooling are two other major water use areas. So the same look and listen routine can basically be applied to these areas very easily. And honestly, it may be already be part of the routine to take a look. So go ahead and hit next. So if we can just add an additional uh, walk around the outside, your cooling tower may, it depends on where it is. Sometimes it's gonna be on the roof and it may not be as easy, but you're gonna find the drain, which will be somewhere on the ground floor. Uh, so basically when you're walking through the landscape, we're looking for excessive water flows, puddles, ponding, anything um, uh, that looks like a leak. And cooling towers are notorious for stuck valves but they're big and scary machines. So it's very easy to walk past them, but simply just like anything else, we'd wanna identify where the drain is. And if we walk by, if we see water running into that drain, every time we walk by, staff can take steps to investigate further with the cooling tower uh, or water quality technician. Um, so this is really a cost effective way that businesses can do what they're already doing and just incorporate water management into it. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So here's some little cards we made. Um, some, they, they're, some, some of them maybe uh, they're, they're uh, more or less technical, but this one was for basically a leak audit. Again, talking about what we talked about, walking through the entire facility, looking and listening, inspect anything that seems abnormal, and then just making this part of the routine. We made these and for, for some of our water uh, providers to give, uh, give to customers if they wanted. Um, I don't know, uh, I had mentioned uh, an example where the cooling tower was leaking or was uh, flowing at 30,000 gallons a day and everybody was just walking by it. I'm sure, Michelle, you probably have an example of something like this. Correct. So say you have your water bills and then all of a sudden you get a higher one. That's usually what triggers a leak audit. So something's off, something's gone higher, you know, so this is a great place to start, you know, walk around, see if you can find it, look, listen, you know, inspect and then repeat. Um, there's a couple things to keep in mind. Um, so first of all, it's ideal to have few or no occupants. So I'm going to give you an example from a school. So we got a call that a school um, had high water use. It was much, much higher than the rest of the schools in the district. Something was going on. So the first thing we did when we got there, 
um, was pick a time. Um, we went during spring break because it was close when there were no students. So that was ideal. Second all is check the meter right when you arrive and see if it was spinning, right? Because there was no students, it shouldn't be spinning. The meter, the water meter in the front should have been theoretically stationary and it was not. It was spinning quite quickly. So we're like, okay, yes, something appears to be off. So then we decided to walk the facility. We went through the whole school, went through all the restrooms, all the fields, and we didn't see it. We were looking, listening, inspecting, and we couldn't see it. So the last thing to do is to ask questions. So we started talking to the managers. We started talking to, you know, the people that work there. And we said, okay, has, have you had anything change? Have you changed out any equipment? You know, have you done anything? Anyways, long story short, it turns out that they had done some construction. I said, oh, when did that occur exactly? And so they gave us a date and a time. And if you, we went back and we looked at the water and when the uh, high water readings had started and sure enough, it was right when that construction occurred. So if you don't see it, if you don't look, ask questions. So we uncovered the leak. It turns out it was subsurface. We couldn't see it on the ground. It was going underneath. Good thing we found it because it, otherwise if we had left it, it probably would have damaged the foundation of that building. Um, it was um, a complication of the construction. They had severed one of their lines. Um, and it had had, the construction was actually six months earlier, but the pipeline we believe was weakened and then it took a while for it actually to break. So then six months later they had this leak and they're like, well, but that was six months ago. So anyways, just think, look, listen, plan, and last but not least, ask questions. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, so that would have been a tough one for staff on site to find because they, uh, you know, you know that was like more of a more of a hidden service line leak and whatnot but um still the majority of leaks that we see um can oftentimes be located by staffs uh running toilets i was at a um uh car wash where uh, the gentleman the manager called me we have a high water bill i went and inspected and it turned out their toilet had a uh, commercial toilet was running at 18 gallons a minute but staff had been turning it on and off with a screwdriver because they didn't know what to do so um, basically by inspecting the facility in his normal, normal daily routine, he was able to locate that. Uh, so this is an example of a leak audit. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, same thing for an irrigation audit. I think we're getting close on time, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, skip some examples. But again, same thing. This is uh, just a good checklist to even give your uh, irrigation um, technician have them go through it. But every time they're there, we're just uh, constantly looking for flowing water, ponding water, puddling water. Next, go ahead, go, ahead, go to the next slide. And then again, this is just a real detailed uh, checklist for um, identifying a leak in the irrigation system. So these were just some cards. I would encourage other water providers to make uh, very simple step-by-step -step cards uh, showing people how to inspect for leaks on their own property. Go ahead, go to the next slide. Yeah, so I hope that was helpful. Um, again, you know, working with your CII uh, customer accounts or if you're a business owner, you know, you're walking around the facility all day, every day. It's part of your standard operating procedures. Just taking a couple minutes to locate where your water using equipment is. As you walk by, put your eyeballs on it, put your earballs on it, listen for a second, and then uh, put it on your radar will we'll probably uh, uh, eliminate a lot of leaks, identify and eliminate a lot of leaks quickly. And uh, I think we're at time, so I really appreciate it. And I look forward to the next presentation. Thank you very much, Michelle and Anaki, very much. Uh, this was a very timely topic, considering that EPA WaterSense program runs over their Fix a Leak week in March. So this is great uh, timing for finding leaks in the commercial, institutional, and industrial sector. Uh, I know we tend to focus more on the residential side, so this is this is great advice uh, for the CII customers. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce Kip Barrett, who is going to talk to us about sustainable energy as a service. Uh, he's with Metris Energy. Uh, so Kip, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, happy to be a member and, and also hear part of your innovations and efficiency series. Uh, first, you know, what a, what a great presentation uh, we all just heard. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and connect them and segue off that. So uh, I'm going to be talking about here 
uh, what options you have to get replacement equipment uh, if your leak is due to uh, faulty or, or inefficient equipment. So my goal is just to walk through what sustainable energy as a service is and how that compares to typical energy, water, and infrastructure efficiency capital project procurement for commercial, industrial, and institutional customers. So who we are, uh, Metris develops, finances, owns, and operates large-scale energy efficiency, renewable energy, water efficiency projects through our Sustainable Energy Services Agreement, or CESA. Uh, throughout my presentation here, you'll hear me kind of use interchangeably uh, the CESA or Sustainable Energy as a Service. Um, for both of them, I'm, I'm referring to the same thing. Uh, one is the agreement and one is the, the overall structure. Um, again, just as a, a preface here, we're not financial advisors or providing financial or tax advice. Uh, next slide. So what are the typical challenges to implementing capital projects? You know, with tens of thousands of water districts in the USA, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of businesses uh, and, and institutions, you know, the amount of challenges to implementing capital projects are far more varied than what I've listed here. Um, but this is just a few that I've heard from our customers. Um, and those are, you know, there, there are too many projects to fund in this cycle. Uh, you know, so they're planning on funding some projects later on. Uh, it includes, you know, funding capacity, but also stakeholder buy-in uh, or issues of competing priorities. Um, the limitation on, on competing priorities and, and projects is not always all or nothing. Uh, a lot of times, kind of capital budgeting, you know, you have incrementally parts of it are lost. So even though they're, they're good pieces, you just don't have the budget to do everything. Um, recently, you know, in, in the near past, if you've used leases to operationalize your savings, um, there have been recent accounting rule changes, both for public and private sector, uh, with regards to having to now capitalize leases on your balance sheet. So now leases are, are not a substitution for, you know, on balance sheet capital budgeting. And then the last one here, sometimes, you know, our clients just aren't sure where to start. Um, and, and that's something we can also help them uh, to try to roadmap for. Next slide. So starting off just on a, a shared um, background here. Um, so traditionally, capital procurement, project procurement has looked like this. The customer, you know, looks to some source of funding, whether that's a bond, a lease, debt, internal capital, and then they contract directly with an ESCO or a contractor for the, the improvement that they're looking at. In some cases, there's a performance guarantee back to the customer stating that, you know, this is actually going to provide uh, what it says it's going to. But no matter what, the customer is always responsible to pay back the source of capital, regardless of the performance of the, of the project. So for a lot of public folks, this is very similar to performance contracting. Um, Performance guarantee is typically less than 100%, you know, and, and that type of structure dates back to the 1970s. Uh, and there's been little evolution since then. Next slide. So on the left here, you know, we kind of see that traditional performance contracting, you know, public sectors use it quite a bit. Uh, private sector, you know, typically a little less so, but it has definitely been a part of it. Um, in the more recent past, what we've seen is an evolution of this to uh, what's known as a power purchase agreement. Um, traditionally used on site for solar. And this is where rather than buying the equipment, the underlying facility owner is simply contracting for the purchase of the power that that solar system produces. And this has a number of benefits. You know, there's no capital budget required. The facility user is still getting all of the benefits of that system as far as the renewable energy provided. And you kind of have, you know, 100% guarantee on the energy provided because if there's no energy produced, you don't have to pay anything. So we see that evolution. In the broader market here, um, we see this evolution as far as, you know, infrastructure as a service, um, cloud providers like AWS and others, you know, are providing 
storage as a service so that you don't have to build a data center just to store your, your information on, on the web. You know, we see this through, you know, hospitality providers like Airbnb or transportation providers like Uber and Lyft where we're starting to separate the ownership of the capital asset with the actual service that it provides. And so the end user, you know, is simplifying their relationship with that service where they only pay for the service. They don't have to deal with the underlying, you know, equipment or asset and the maintenance of that. So that kind of history brings us to, you know, where we see the sustainable energy as a service offering and that is it's third party it's off balance sheet it really encompasses you know all of the things we've talked about here water efficiency water infrastructure energy efficiency renewable energy um, it's really an umbrella structure that allows you to incorporate whatever types of assets you want under a pay for performance structure where you're outsourcing the ownership of that equipment and the maintenance and the performance risk of it. Um, the other kind of requirement here for them is that it provides both immediate and long-term savings. Next slide. So how does that look in comparison to the traditional procurement process? There, the customer was responsible both for the funding as well as for the, the contractual relationship to actually build and operate the equipment. In this case, the customer is solely responsible for paying for performance. Um, Metra stands in the middle there. It owns and operates the equipment. It takes performance risk, and it contracts and provides the capital to actually build and install the project. Next slide. So what does a typical sustainable energy as a project look like? It's a very broad category. Uh, like I said, it can include water efficiency, uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy production, really anything that can be quantified in a unit of measurement and measured for performance can be included in a, a services agreement. Project size is typically a little larger um, we see one to 20 million being the, the average size there. But that can be spread across multiple different facilities, multiple different measures, and they all get bundled into one single project. Um, as far as the, the return on those projects, the payback for them, you know, we typically see five to 12 years simple payback, meaning that if you just look at the, the efficiency gained and the savings that that produces, whether it's operational, whether it's energy or water, um, those projects are, are paying for themselves over the course of five to 12 years. And that translates to a CSER, Sustainable Energy as a Service Agreement term length of generally seven to 20 years. So these tend to be longer term agreements and they tend to be larger uh, gross dollar value agreements. Next slide. So, what does that typical kind of project look like from the customer standpoint? And here I think, you know, it's really important to point out that these are really operational projects. Um, they don't have any impact on the balance sheet. There is no traditional kind of capital procurement payback period. So year zero and before, the customer's paying X amount for their utility bill, they're paying X amount for their water bill or infrastructure cost. At that point, the project is funded by the third party and it creates some measurable form of savings. Over the term of that agreement, the savings are split with some portion of the savings going to pay back the project over the agreement and some portion of the savings remaining with the customer so they're, they're cash flow positive from day one. Sorry, with that, um, you know, there is variability there. Um, if the customer wants to see more day one cash flow, uh, you can extend the term of the agreement. After the contract term, no matter what the actual performance has been, because that's a risk that the third party takes, the customer is able to realize 100% of the savings moving forward. 
So again, mitigates risk of performance. They're only paying for measured and realized savings through the term of the agreement. Uh, next slide. So kind of going through and looking at, you know, what is a CISA agreement? You know, stepping back and looking at this from a, a, a broader market perspective, you know, this is in terms of energy efficiency, water efficiency, it's a relatively small part of the market to date, um, but projections have it growing substantially, four to five X over just the next six to seven years um, because of kind of the inherent benefits of the arrangement versus traditional capital projects. So again, really any project that can create operational savings can be funded um, regardless of any internal capital allocation. Next slide. So, you know, understanding that it's a growing market, you know, going back and, and comparing the CISA to kind of a traditional capital budget funding mechanism. So, you know, one of the things I like to point out here is that in any capital budgeting process that I've been involved in, whether it's public or private, I've never seen it where it actually grows in scope, where you identify, you know, all the projects you want to do, and then at the end of the day, you're doing more projects than you had identified. Um, I have traditionally only ever seen that that budgeting process reduce in scope based on budget availability. Um, so one of the real clear distinctions here with the, uh, the CISA type of funding is that it allows for project scope to grow over the project evaluation period because you really have no capital budgeting limitations. So as you go through the process of identification of projects that are, are good, that can pay for themselves, you're able to incorporate those in the agreement without regard for any kind of internal competing budgetary priorities. Next slide. So what do kind of the, the traditional, you know, capital budgeting cash flows look like compared to a FISA cash flow? So here we always kind of look at you know, both the, the project by project comparison, making sure that you have good projects that are, that are able to pay for themselves. But two, we look more broadly at it from a perspective of what is the cost of delaying projects? So if we're not able to fund them all in this budgetary cycle, you know, and, and we know, you know, maybe two, three, four years down the road, we're, we're going to get to funding these projects. There is an inherent cost in waiting to fund these projects, both from the measurement of you know, energy savings, but also from the perspective of conservation of resources, whether that's water, whether that's energy. So in looking at this example here, real world example um, from one of our customers, you know, they had identified a number of projects around $4.7 million worth that they had planned to fund over five years. So, we did a comparison between what that funding would look like if we did them all day one through a, a CISA where they were just paying uh, for performance and they were sharing the savings that those projects created over the term of the agreement versus if they allocated that money over that time period and did all those projects kind of in series over time. And here, regardless of any discount rate you use or any kind of time value of money comparison, just the gross dollar amounts from the projects show that over the 15 year term of this analysis, you know, the CISA is actually providing you more positive cash flow just because you're realizing those savings earlier and taking them over a longer period of time versus waiting over that period to, to do that through a capital budgeting process. Next slide. So kind of summing up, those differences between, you know, capital versus the CISA, you know, the real key benefits from a financial perspective for the CISA, you know, there's, there's no capital outlay. There's no competition for internal resources or budget allocation. You know, you're seeing immediate positive cash flow from energy, water, infrastructure, renewable energy projects. You're paying only for measured savings, which means that there's no risk of underperformance. 
Um, there's a preservation of, of debt capacity or bonding capacity under GASB and FASB, uh, which are the public and private sector accounting guidelines. Um, you're able to look at this from a very holistic perspective across all your facilities, across all your different measures, you know, versus kind of the traditional, very narrow viewpoint, measure by measure, facility by facility. Operation, you have a currency approach to holistically look at all of your operational efficiency measures and upgrade them. Um, it includes ongoing maintenance and monitoring, and it provides for a safer and cleaner employee environment. Next slide. So with all that said, you know, we at Metris kind of see ourselves positioned here uh, in the market. We were the first mover. Uh, we've been doing this for over 10 years. Um, we're very transparent. We're able to work with, you know, any service provider that you already work with, as long as they're bankable. Um, we're able to work on a wide variety of different measures. I think to date we've looked at 36 different types of technologies. And we underwrite to 100% of expected savings, which if you've ever seen a, a production guarantee, um, you'll never see a 100% savings guaranteed. So incrementally, you're gaining uh, right there. And then, uh, again, flexibility. You know, we, we want to match our funding capabilities to what your needs are, not come to you with a, a specific solution or, you know, tell you what you need. Uh, we just want to help you acquire what it is that you already know you need. Uh, next slide. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, I appreciate all of your time here. I know we're going to have time for some questions after this, but uh, should anything not get answered, uh, I'm always happy to answer any questions you might have or might think of uh, a couple days down the road. So appreciate all of your time here and, and look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Kip. Uh, we appreciate it too, and we know we're going to have some questions for you. Uh, but before we go to that, what I'd like to do is give people time to uh, enter questions in the dialog box and just do a few little announcements. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, you know, as, as we mentioned, type in your questions. We'll answer them while we have our speakers here. But if we do run out of time, if we get to the top of the hour and it turns out your question hasn't been answered or you haven't thought of it until after the webinar is over, you can email Liam at the email address here and uh, we will make sure we get the answer to the question for you from our speakers. Um, in terms of the materials from this webinar, a PDF of the presentation as well as a link for the webinar recording will be available in a few days. We will post the recording on our YouTube channel and link it to our website as well. So it'll be available for future viewing. And um, just wanna take a moment to remind you that our next webinar will be our regular quarterly webinar with the with EPA, the WaterSense program. Uh, that webinar will talk about the benefits of soil moisture sensors. So watch for that announcement and, and sign up for that. Uh, we should be getting information about that out very soon. And if you're not familiar with the Alliance for Water Efficiency, you can sign up for regular efficiency news and events from us at our website. And if you're not a member, we would love to have you. Um, so at this point, I will ask Liam what questions we might have. I know Aniki also has a question for Kip, so uh, let's see what you've got so far. All right, yeah, thanks, Marianne. Uh, first question is for Kip, it looks like. Uh, with customers' energy use growing over time due to, for example, increased manufacturing production, how does SEAAS ratchet that? Uh, might the rate be indexed to production levels? Absolutely. That, that's a great question. So as part of the SES process, um, we do both a, a preliminary analysis to help the customers understand what measures, what savings they might be able to expect by moving forward with certain, you know, measures. But once we've identified those, you know, kind of have an understanding of, of what the scope is, um, we work with one of our partners to go in and do uh, what's known as an investment grade audit. And that audit includes, 
you know, both actual um, measurement tools to determine what usage is over a period of time, whether that's a couple of months, um, as well as, you know, looking at the, the baseline draws on, on certain circuits. But once we've created that baseline, we and the customer will agree that that is the baseline. And so deviations off of that based on increased usage or, you know, other changes at the facility level um, will be dealt with contractually. So the customer will still receive the, you know, the, the benefit of the more efficient equipment. Um, but we do limit kind of our, our risk in the increase in energy consumption being due to a change at the facility level. All right, thank you. Uh, hold on just one second, I lost my place here. Uh, looks like another question for you, Kip. Uh, how, are, how are the risks related to increasing utility rates factored into SEAAS? <laughs> another great question. Um, so again, with, with utility rates, you know, we can work uh, with our partners to kind of do a, a forecast of what utility escalation rates are. Um, but at the end of the day, that, that's another kind of parameter that we would agree with uh, the customer as to what that would be pegged to. Um, and then, you know, that would be contractually obligated. Um, in some cases, our customers choose to have that pegged to a 0% escalator. So assuming that there is no escalation. Um, that does limit project economics. Um, in many cases, you know, if you do a forward cast of utility rates, you know, you're looking at two, three plus percent, in some cases stated. So it, it really becomes a question of, you know, what the facility owner is comfortable with as far as expectations of, of rising utility rates in the future. All right, uh, another one for you, Kip. Uh, so many CII facilities are dead fixes on a two-year payback. You offer a way around that, but what do you do to get them off of the two-year fixation? Yeah, another another great question. So, you know, I think the key is if folks at the facility level or at the corporate level are really fixated on that two-year simple payback measurement is that through this type of service, your payback is actually immediate because what we're offering is day one cash flow positive um, cash flow to the organization. And then, you know, we look at it kind of from a facility level. We're able to work with leased or owned facilities, but, you know, let's say the customer's lease is 10 years. You know, when you go in there and you're upgrading equipment and the agreement term is less than the 10 years, if they're seeing day one cash flow you know, there, there really is no kind of facility level risk with taking that cash flow now and, and kind of going around that two year limitation. All right, thanks, Kip. Uh, here's one for the Madaus team. Uh, are you finding that group webinar sessions are useful for CII customers to train on leaks or audit practices, or are you mostly focused on one on one assistance? I, uh, this is Michelle. I would say, yes, they're effective. Um, I think it helps to know what you're looking for um, and also uh, find practical applications, you know, um, just saying to look for leaks is one thing, but actually, you know, kind of talking through what you're finding um, and or any items, um, you know, that are most common uh, are definitely helpful. And, um, and or having someone actually walking around with uh, their phone and having Zoom on it. Um, that's how we've been doing virtual trainings during COVID. Um, it's been very effective um, to, you know, help people while they're in the field. And it can be group done or it can be individual. Both we have actually been finding work very, very well. Yeah, and this is Anika, I'll just follow that up with saying, you know, if you can't get into a facility and it's a CII uh, facility staff, you know, a lot of times people don't understand when a leak is a leak. So if there's constant flow from a complex piece of equipment, it's just com complex enough to where it gets ignored. You know, I've seen cooling towers where they've run for literally years because when the 
bumped, somebody started, the machine was running nonstop. So we just, it's like a piece of equipment. I don't know what it does. It was running when I got here. I guess it's supposed to do that. So these things can go on and on and on without people realizing that it's a leak because it's going into a drain. So really trying to help people identify, find the spots in your facility that use water. Not, almost nothing should be using water constantly. And then get kind of empowering those uh, CII facilities to, to be aware of those uh, basically vulnerability points themselves. They can identify, because an audit is going to, find some things, but honestly, it's a one point in time where if they're walking by every single day, they have an opportunity every single day to identify a, a problem. All right, thank you both. Uh, I, I'm not sure who this one's for. I think another one for the Manassas perhaps, but uh, how, uh, how good is your ability to get inside an owner's systems and run them yourself? Uh, are, you, are, are you running them yourself? I will. I will. No, we don't. We um, so as Medallis, we we can offer. Uh, you know, we work mostly with water providers. So, uh, or but we can do technical assistance. But typically, you have um, CI facilities going through their water providers, or it's like a specific leak detection or something. But it's not a it's not a service as uh, Kip was talking about. So that question maybe have been directed to him. But it's really like a you know specific problem troubleshooting. So that's the kind of goal is for giving them the tools to to basically manage, incorporate water management into their existing systems. Yep, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm actually being told that was for uh, Metris, so I apologize. But, yeah, uh, I think so to, too. Yeah. Yeah, Michelle, feel free. No, go ahead. I think it's for Kip. Uh, sure. So, you know, with respect to that, it, it really depends on the type of equipment and the relationship that already exists. Um, we're able to work with customers who are, you know, owning, operating, and maintaining their equipment themselves and kind of recontract with them to provide that service underneath our agreement. You know, they just have to be willing to kind of contractually obligate themselves to meet the, the terms and requirements that we have for warranty satisfaction and just best practice of, of maintaining that equipment. Um, we're also able to work with a lot of times facility owners will have kind of a third party manager uh, for that. So we're able to contract with them. And then the third option is, is where we're bringing the equipment. We're also bringing um, the kind of operations and maintenance uh, for that equipment underneath our agreement. Um, in all three cases, um, Metris is responsible for um, and does provide for the cost of that underneath our agreement. All right, thank you. And uh, Kip, I, uh, Anaki actually had a question for you. Uh, if you can uh, provide any case study of a, uh, an example of a water efficiency project. Absolutely. Um, so um, almost all of our projects are multi-measure. So, um, you know, in, in the case of water efficiency, I know that it's been a large part, we've done a number of higher education institutions, and all of these are on our website. So if, if folks would like to go and actually see it written and, and see it highlighted, uh, we have a case study section on our website, and I encourage you to, to go and look through those. Um, but um, for the higher ed ones, which are kind of front and center in my mind right now, um, you know, the water efficiency measures that we had there were both, um, you know, around low flow um, for fixtures inside of the buildings, um, as well as um, controls and kind of, you know, repairs and upgrades to uh, the external uh, irrigation systems. You know, outside of, of the higher ed stuff, um, we're working on a few right now that are, are process equipment actually within a commercial industrial users um, manufacturing process where we're going in and both kind of repairing and, and bringing up to class uh, pieces of equipment but also including controls uh, to better utilize that so it, it's really dependent on you know what the need is but uh, we're able to you know 
get pretty in, involved in even a manufacturing process to, to show some water efficiency gains. All right, and the last question that we have, it looks like it could be for either of you. Uh, do you work in Canada? Yes, <laughs> this is Medell Water Management. We um, did one of our virtual trainings um, in Calgary, Canada, and we're still working with them. Um, and we did it virtually because the Canadian border was closed due to COVID. Um, but yes, we have um, trained in Calgary, um, we have also trained um, in Abbotsford, which is in British Columbia. So we work in English units and metric units, and we work um, actually all over the world. We work internationally as well. So um, yes, <laughs> short answer. Yeah, and I'll, I'll answer it as well. Um, so to date, we have not done a project in Canada. Um, we are absolutely interested in international work. I would say, though, that typical project size would probably have to be you know, at least in the middle range um, to kind of justify, you know, the, the brain damage of, of working internationally there. So um, we're, we're open to it um, for a, a large enough project. All right, and that is all we have for questions right now. All right, well, thank you all so much. Um, you know, Michelle, Anaki, and Kip for a great set of presentations. Um, we will uh, make sure that any questions that our attendees may still want to ask, uh, we'll forward them uh, to you for potential answering. So if you think of something after the webinar is over, uh, feel free to email Liam and we'll take care of it. But uh, thank you all very much for um, participating with us in the webinar, the Alliance for Water Efficiency, not only thanks the speakers, but all of you attendees for being with us during this hour. And uh, join us again. Thank you.